just to give you a reminder of kind of where we're going in the book of Colossians. All of the book of Colossians is about our identity in Christ. What it means for us to identify with Him. And then if we've, as we've come to chapter 3, uh, Paul began what later became chapter 3. For him, it was just one big, long letter. Uh, but in, in what we read as the beginning of chapter 3, we were reminded that we were to put aside the things on the earth, and we were to now to have new aspirations for things that were heavenly, a new way of living, to understand that because of our identity in Christ, that this world is no longer our pattern for life. We've been given a new pattern for life. And that is because of this relationship that God has given to us in Christ. What a glorious thing it is in the fact that in being born again, we now have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and enabling us to live the kind of life that would not have been possible otherwise. However, on our part, there is the responsibility to yield to that. To seek that, as Paul said at the beginning of chapter 3, to set our affection on that, to, to, to desire that God would fulfill in us the kind of life he has created us to have. And then he began to spell that out, what that would look like, that in order for that to happen, there are some things in our life that we have to put to death. Kind of the natural inclinations of living, to understand that there's an, still an old nature very active in us that that had us for most of our lives and that still tries to control our thoughts and our attitudes and our drive and, and tries to steer our life in its own course to fulfill its own uh, plan for our life. But then on the other hand, once we've put to death that old desire and that old nature that God has opened us up to us a brand new way of life, of putting on a whole new way of life that will lead us. We saw in perfect harmony, <clears throat> or as we looked at that word, what that meant to come to maturity. In the last week, we looked a little bit about what that maturity would look like, that how our life would be saturated with the word of Christ, and how the peace of Christ, that's the relationship we have with Christ, would form and shape our life. And and how the name of Jesus would become the desire of everything in our life, that we would do it in his name. But now Paul's going to get a little bit specific. In fact, Paul's going to get a little bit personal now. <laughs> He's going to get to a place that we would rather really him not go. How does our relationship with Jesus affect our family life? Because he was speaking to a group of people who had been living in a very secular culture and they're their family had been shaped by what their culture said a family should be. And you know what? You and I kind of live in that same kind of world today. Family life has been shaped by culture. In one sense, it's been shaped by what you observed, either positively or negatively, in your parents before you. And, and so you learned a lot about how to or how not to do family life, whichever the case may be, based on that, probably like most of us, some of both. Some good and some, some bad in that. So you learn from history. You learn from your experience. You learn from the culture around us. You learn from watching other families. You may have had friends uh, that you spent a good deal of time with their family, and you watch their family dynamic. Or even more so in our culture, uh, the portrayal of family, even in my lifetime, the portrayal of family on television. I mean, we went all the way from the adventures of Ozzie and Harriet and Leave it to Beaver to married with children and the Simpsons. How did we get from Ozzie and Harriet to the Bundys? I do not know. Now, some of you are looking at me like you ain't ever watched TV a day in your life. You need to maybe look up some of this in your life. What in the world is our culture telling us about how family life ought to be? Well, we are all shaped by that in some form or fashion. But our relationship with Jesus, our identity in Jesus, calls us to an even richer family life than our culture can depict for us. Because God is bringing us to maturity as believers. When mature 
believers dwell together in a family and they live out their relationship with Jesus in the family dynamic, it becomes both a God-honoring and a self-satisfying family experience. But here's what I want you to understand, kind of the main point of where we're going with this today, and then we're going to hit high gear and dive right into it. And I will be, I promise I will be an equal opportunity offender today. All right, it doesn't matter if you're a husband, a wife, a child, or a parent, you're going to leave today going, oh, I really wish he hadn't said that. So if that's the case, if, if everybody leaves a little bit rubbed a little bit raw today, I'll feel like I've accomplished my purpose uh, that God has brought me to. But the main point I want you to get is this, that, that it is our identity in Christ that should drive and affect how we relate in our families and how we relate in our families can be a demonstration of the gospel of Jesus to everyone that our family comes in contact with. And I want, to know, I, I want you to understand, I know we have all different kinds of families represented. We have single-parent families. We have blended families. We have what some would call traditional families. I don't like using that as a family is a family. Um, we have single families. Some of you are living now by yourself and may not have children around you. Some, some of you may uh, have never had children. Or you may have never had children and never even been married. But I want to speak primarily today to those who have influence in some form of family structure. As a, maybe a husband or a wife or a parent or a grandparent or a child, whatever the case may be. And let the Word of God speak to us today. So we're going to hit four different roles in family life and see what God's Word says. Let me invite you back to Colossians 3. And I want to read for us, uh, we, we read verses 15 through 17 to kind of remind us where we were coming into this, okay? That's what, where the scripture reading was going in that. And so remember that we're, all of these verses are woven together. They are not separate on their own. They're saying a, a unified message. So let's go back to verse 17. Whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus giving thanks to God the Father through him. So here is a presumption I'm going to make today. I'm going to make the presumption that whatever role you have in a family, it is your desire to fulfill that role in a way that brings honor and glory to the name of Jesus. That in your words and in your deeds, in your family life, that your goal, more than anything else, is to bring honor and glory to the name of of Jesus. And with that, we proceed. Let's read in verse 18. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged. So as we look at this, let's break down each of the four family roles that Paul mentions and remind ourselves how that family role can bring glory to the name of Jesus and by doing so, preach the gospel to people around him. First of all, we see that a wife takes a supportive role to her husband. Now let me just say, you don't have sermon notes uh, there in your bulletin, but on the, on the back of your bulletin at the bottom there is a QR code. If you've got your cell phone with you, you can go to that. There'll be a link to the sermon notes. If you don't do QR codes with your phone, but you have internet at home, there's a link there when you get home. Uh, you can go to that link. You can download the sermon notes and be reminded of what we, we said today. But the first role that we're looking at is about the wife. A wife takes a supportive role to her husband. Now let's think about that word support just a minute, and let's look back in the text. Wives, he says, submit yourselves to your husbands. Now your translation may or may not read the word yourself in there. Some do, some don't. But the grammar of the word submit here does include that connotation. 
And what we gather from that is that this is not something that is to be forced. This is not something that is to be demanded, but the wife voluntarily takes a particular role, and it is a role of support. Now, understand this submission, it comes from really from a military word. And uh, it's a word that speaks of order and speaks of a particular arrangement. It does not speak about value. It does not speak about um, somebody being more important than someone else. It is voluntarily taking a role of support for the husband and for the rest of the family. Some things it doesn't mean. Ladies, it does not mean that you are inferior in any way to your husband. It does not mean that you are not as smart as your husband. In fact, your experience may be that that certainly is not the case. Uh, it, it simply means that in order for the family to function, you have seen, as God did in the, uh, in the Garden of Eden, when God created a special person just for Adam to be a suitable helper. That's an important thing. We go back to creation for this. Adam could not do it by himself. God said, it is not good for man to be alone. You know what? That's still true. <laughs> Those of you that have husbands, when you leave them alone to their own devices, you come back home and you realize, it is not good for my man to be alone. He makes a mess of things when I'm not here to keep him straight. God recognized that Adam could not be alone. So what did he do? He didn't create somebody from the dust like he did Adam. He didn't create something from Adam's toe. Uh, he didn't pull off Adam's ear. He went to Adam's side. Now, I think there's some significance in that. In that this was a helper to come alongside of. Not to be trampled on, not to be domineering over, or not to be domineered, but a supportive person on the side so that the family unit could carry out the work that God called him, had called them to do. Adam could not be fruitful and multiply on his own. Adam could not have dominion over all creation on his own. Uh, Adam could not manage the garden that God had given to him on his own. For all the responsibility that God had given Adam, it was going to be a two-person job. And he created a very specific person, a very specific gender. Now, I don't want to go off on this an incredible tangent, but living in the day and age in which we live, I feel the need to bring that up. That God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve. God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and question mark. God created Adam and Eve, not Adam and other. God was not confused with gender at creation, and he's still not confused today. Here's why that's important. It's great to be a man. It's great to be a woman because both, both are the image of God. Male and female, God created them in his own image. Male and female, he created them. There are parts of the, the female gender that, that, that reflect the image of God that as males we can't or we don't. And so understand that your role as a helper, a, voluntary, a voluntarily a supportive role to make the family unit work in a way that brings glory to the name of Jesus is vitally important and is a God-ordained role, and is pleasing to him. But notice that she is to submit to her husband as is fitting to the Lord. As is fitting to the Lord, as is acceptable, as right in the Lord. It is your relationship with Jesus that causes you to volunteer to take this role, not your relationship to your husband. It's not because your husband asks you to, it's because Jesus asks you to. It's not because your husband wants you to, it's because Jesus wants you to. It's because Jesus created you for that. And, and Jesus created you for him and him for you. And, and it's fitting for him. But now let me give you a caveat of what this doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that a woman does everything her husband says to do. Because a woman's primary submission is to Christ. It's to Jesus. And so you are never expected in God's economy of things to do something your husband may ask you to do that goes contrary to the Word of God, that causes you to sin, 
that causes you to be in a disobedience to God. But you know what I found? That, that's usually not a problem. Now, every now and then there may be this outlier of an issue in somebody's life where it does. But notice that this is fitting for the family to be ordered this way. This is fitting according to the Lord. This is in him. A wife's voluntary submission to her husband demonstrates the gospel to the world around us because it reflects our submission as the bride of Christ to our bridegroom Jesus. You think about that for a moment. There's no accident that Jesus refers to the church as his bride. And then Jesus uses texts such as this and Trust me, when we get to the men, we're going to go to Ephesians 5 for a second. Because it reflects the gospel in that it says, you know what? I submit to my husband because my husband, as the bride of Christ, submits to Christ. And I, as the bride of Christ, I submit to Christ. And our children, who are born again as part of the bride of Christ, submit themselves to Christ. And the world around us sees a voluntarily a voluntary submission and recognizes the reason this is done is because of our identity in Christ. Because in submitting or taking on whatever of these family roles we take, whichever God has given to us we take, in fulfilling that role, we bring glory to Christ and we point people to Him. So wives, voluntarily take on a supportive role to your husband. Encourage him. That doesn't mean you don't challenge him every now and then. We need challenging. We need your wisdom. We need your direction. We need your intuition. We need your input. We need every, God would not have brought us side by side and made us partners in this relationship if you weren't vital and important to us. But by the same token, understand that what you are doing is you are enabling him to take on the role that God has given to him. You are helping him please God. And in helping him please God, you are pleasing God. All right, so ladies, if you still love me, say amen. Okay, thank you. Husbands, let's get to you. In verse 19, he goes on to say, Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. What we see here is a husband loves his wife like Christ loves us. Now, guys, that's a tall order when you stop and think about it. We're going we're to dive into that in just a minute. But, but the word here for love is the Greek word uh, agapao, and it's a kind of love that doesn't expect reciprocation. It loves without any thought whatsoever that I may get something back for this. In other words, I'm not treating my wife with love because I want her to do something for me. I'm treating my wife with love just out of my, how I value her as a person, as a child of God. It's the kind of love that God gives to us. God doesn't love us based on any kind of merit on our own. God doesn't love us because we are just so lovable. Trust me, we're not a lot of the time. And even when we're not lovable, God still loves us. Men, you don't love your wife because you love your wife just because. Let me say that again because sometimes as guys, we don't pay attention. You don't love your wife because you love your wife just because. You love your wife because. You ask God to fill your heart with love for your wife. You you see your wife the way you want Jesus to see you. Now, it has also a very, I think, a very interesting attitude that it produces when we love our wives that way. Why Paul included this may have had something to do with what was going on in the church at Colossae. I don't know, but it is a universal fact. If you love your wife, you won't be harsh. The word for harsh means bitter. And men, sometimes we have a short fuse, I understand. Sometimes we've had a bad day. And sometimes it don't take much to set us off. 
What I'm saying is that as we allow our identity in Christ to remake us and reshape us, the fruit of the Spirit, the very first thing that's listed in Galatians 5.22 as the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love. Before there's joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, there's love. Love is an indication that we are allowing the Spirit of God to take us away from the natural inclinations. That's what we read about earlier in chapter 3 uh, in, in verses 5 through 11. That we were to put to death all that natural, automatic response and to allow the Holy Spirit to develop in us Maybe a delayed release response. A stop and think before we speak response. We love our wife by being gentle with our wife. But ultimately, Ephesians 5.25 gives us the big clue. And speaking on these same topics to the Ephesian church, Paul says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church, and gave himself up for her. Now, men, let that sink in for a moment. As is a literary equals sign. Love your wife equal to Christ loving you. Think about that for a moment. We need to pray. We need the Holy Spirit's help, but the goal should be for us to love our wives the way we want Jesus to love us. And what did it say about it there in, in Ephesians 5? He gave himself up for her. Our modern culture used to be, this is how extreme we've gone. Okay, back in Ozzie and Harriet and leave it to Beaver. So with the Nelsons and the Cleavers. The husband came in from work, kicked off his shoes, and the wife had supper ready. And she was always, her hair was always perfect, and everything was, you know, wonderful and great. And the kids never had a bad day at school, and the dog was glad they came home. You know, all this good stuff. But it was all about the husband. In fact, there was even a show called Father Knows Best. Now, that was fiction, wasn't it? Father knows. It was all about the dad and how great the dad was. But then somewhere around the 80s, things started changing. And now all of a sudden, in modern depiction of the husband, the husband is, for lack of a better way to word it, he is a bumbling fool. And if it weren't for his wife and his kids bailing him out of trouble all the time, what a mess he would be. The truth is somewhere in between those two extremes. But men, it's neither all about us, nor are we useless and insignificant and a drain on the family, but it's not about us. It's not about us. The first mark of a godly man is that in being like Christ, first thing he does, he gives himself up. He serves he serves his family, serves his wife. It's all about doing everything that he can do in order to show love for his wife by serving her. As Christ has served us on the cross, the Son of Man came to serve, Jesus said, and to give his life a ransom for many. Guys, that's a tall order. But our order is to love our wives in such a way that we give ourselves up. And you know what, guys? Our sacrificial love for our wife will demonstrate the gospel and that it shows the love that Jesus has for his bride. The world will know the love of Jesus by viewing the love of a husband and a father. You will preach a better sermon than I could ever preach on the love of God. By the way, you let people around you see you love your wife, you love your family, sacrificially as Jesus did. Love your wife the way you want Jesus to love you, and everything will be okay. All right, men, if you still love me, say amen. <laughs> yeah, uh-oh. All right. 
God will deal with you later. <laughs> we men are slow adopters. It's all right. God will show you the truth of it. Thirdly, we see what does it mean to be a child that does things. And by child, well, let's read the verse first of all. Let's, let's look at verse 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Now, again, let me just say that in everything is somewhat conditional because we're speaking here. Now, when he, when he talks about the children, the context here seems to be these are children that still live at home for whatever reason. They could be young or they could be old and just not married yet, whatever the case may be. But these are children who are still connected to the household. Now, in, in their culture, a lot of times what would happen is when a, when a, when a, when a son got married, he brought his wife home to his father's house and they just added on to the father's house and he had he and his family had their own wing to the house now, those of you that have grandchildren you know how great it is the two two happiest days in your life are when your grandchildren come to visit and when they go back home all right i understand that now, they had them all the time in a lot of cases so it could have been those children, it could have been younger children, but it's children who were still in some way connected to the household, yet children who were old enough that they were still morally responsible for their decisions and their actions and their reactions. They could, they could have biblical teaching handed to them, and they could understand that biblical teaching and internalize it and choose to obey that biblical teaching. So all of you in here are at least at that age. So when he says, children, obey your parents in everything, the same caveat applies. It applied to the wives. No, your, your parents don't have a right to demand that you disobey God and go against God's teaching. And if you be thankful if you are in a home that loves God and that desires to please God. Because a lot of your friends at school don't have that kind of home. A lot of kids grow up with a messed up home. You may think yours is a little odd. But you think about some of your friends. You think about what they get when they go home, what they listen to, what they hear, and what they face. So let me just kind of put the parentheses here to you that are kids and say, don't take your home for granted, okay? Be thankful. Be understanding. Try to be cooperative. But what, let's go back to the scripture. What does he say? He says to obey. And, and the word here, obey, grammatically is in present tense, meaning it's an ongoing action. So we're not talking about these moments that are difficult and you should obey. It's talking about your general disposition should be one that you are a compliant to some degree child. That you understand your parents' role in your life is to help you become all that Jesus wants you to become. And in helping you become all that Jesus wants you to become, God has placed them in your life to help you be all that you can be in Him. And so you recognize that in your life. That's why uh, it, Paul goes on to say that when you obey your parents and everything, this pleases the Lord. God is pleased with you when you recognize their role in your life and you understand the reasons that they are doing things is that God has placed this responsibility on them and you are allowing them to help you become all that you want them to be. Does that mean your parents are, are never going to get on your nerves? Absolutely not. In fact, sometimes we do it just for the sheer entertainment value of getting on your nerves. Because honestly, you make it entertaining sometimes the way you react when we get on your nerves. You don't know this, but when you go to the door and slam your room, your parents sit there and snicker. Wasn't that funny? Did you see the way her veins were popping out of her head? She about, hey, did you see? We, she, boy, she, can you believe we did? No, we really don't do that. I'm just kidding. Sort of. Sometimes, though, it breaks our heart. I have to tell you something you don't want to hear. But because we do have some spiritual insight or spiritual wisdom or because of the responsibility, you know, I wish, all of us as parents, wish we could always just let our kids have everything they want and do everything they want to do. We wish we could. But part of being old 
is having made a bunch of mistakes and gained a little bit of wisdom and recognize the danger in some things. And we know when to kind of pump the brakes and say, whoa, wait a minute. Let's see. I want you to understand that and, and to recognize that. A child's obedience to their parents demonstrates the gospel by showing how all of us as believers show our love to our Heavenly Father. In 1 John chapter 5 and verse 3, John said, For this is the love of God. So he's just going to tell you what, how you demonstrate your love for God. This is the love of God that we keep His commandments. We obey Him. We demonstrate our love for God by obeying Him. And when you obey your parents, you are letting people know, I'm doing this because of my identity in Christ. Because I recognize that as, as fallible and as difficult as my he earthly father is, I have a heavenly father who is ultimately sovereign over my life. And I can trust my heavenly father to make up for where my earthly father may be lacking. And let me just say that, and we'll move on to parents, but if you didn't have a good experience with your earthly father, understand that you've got a heavenly father that in every way your earthly father lacked, your heavenly father makes up for it in abundance. Now, there are some things that doesn't help with, I understand. That doesn't just magically make things right. But I want you to know that your Heavenly Father sees, your Heavenly Father knows. Your Heavenly Father understands, your Heavenly Father cares. But if you do have a reasonably good relationship with your parents, be thankful. And then finally, I'm not going to ask the kids if they love me because it was trending down. I don't want my feelings hurt. But finally, we see that a parent treats their children gently because God is gentle with his children. Look at verse 20. Or excuse me, verse 21. Fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. Now, this is the only one in the three roles, this is the only one that is presented to us as a prohibitive, a don't do. All the others were do, this one is a don't do. But from the don't do, we can extrapolate what we should do. Don't, it says, provoke your children. The word therefore provoke is like agitating or poking it's the idea of, of inciting or stirring up in a negative kind of way. And so the issue here then is to, it doesn't mean that you should never do something that disappoints your child or that your child disagrees with. Because you're going to need to do that from time to time. But it speaks about your overall spirit of leadership in your family. And when you think about how gentle God is with us, think about what Jesus said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Why? Because I am gentle and lowly in heart, and here you will find rest for your souls. That's the Heavenly Father that we have. And so parents, should we, we should strive even in our firmness, even in our, in our solidness, in our strength, at least to wield that strength and, and be solid in a gentle manner. Why? Because it says if you do provoke them, they will become discouraged. And that literally means to lose passion, to just give up. I think sometimes, as parents, if we're not careful, we're just always so negative, always so no, always so harsh that our children get to the point where they want to say, what's the use? I'll never make them happy anyway. I'm never going to live up to their standard. I'm never going to be right in their eyes. 
so they don't even try. In younger children, that's an explanation of a lot of times why kids act out. Because they are seeking attention from somebody. Because they're not getting that gentle, loving attention at home. And what happens is as we get older, those patterns begin to develop in us. And we don't call it acting out anymore. We call it breaking the law. Or getting into some other kind of trouble. In some other form or fashion. Parents, our responsibility is to lead and to lead our children to be godly, but to do so with the same gentle spirit with which God leads us. And here's what I want to say to that. Always, always, always leave an open window for your children to have hope, for hope to shine through that window. No matter how rough a patch it may be, no matter how stern you may have been, always leave a window open through which hope can come in their life. Don't ever slam that window shut so they feel like there's no hope. I've seen the meme on Facebook a few times, and I think it speaks to this. Two reactions to a child who gets in trouble or has an accident. Number one is, oh no, my father's going to kill me. The second reaction is, I've got to call my dad because I really need him right now. I see that, and it challenges my heart because I want to be that second dad. I don't want to have ever provoked, irritated to the point where, oh no, My dad's going to kill me. I want my daughter to always know she's got an open door to come to talk to me about anything. Am I going to approve of it? I may or I may not. may not always agree with her. But she's always got an open door. She's always going to find gentle. She's always going to find, well, let's talk about this. Now, just to be confessional, I haven't always succeeded in that task. By God's grace, over the years, as I've matured as a parent, I've asked God to help me in that respect. Let me tell you something, parents. Our identity in Christ leads us to shepherd our children in the same way we expect God to shepherd us. Old song we used to sing in church called, Gentle Shepherd, Come and Lead Us. Interesting thing about a shepherd, there's a difference in tending sheep and tending cows. You herd cows from behind. You push them. You best lead sheep from in front, drawing them along with you. Jesus said, my sheep know my voice And they follow me, and they will not listen to the voice of a stranger. They follow me. This gentle shepherd that leads us, not drives us. Parents, may we learn by the grace of God to deal gently. Even when that child gets on your last nerve. Even when you get the look. And if you're a parent, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That look. Or, how about this one? Even when you get the eye roll or the smirk, as parents, we've all dealt with those. But if we're honest about it, there are some spiritual ways that we give God an eye roll. Or we give God, like, really, God? Seriously? You're kidding me, right? But gently, our shepherd leads us. Gently may we lead our children. May our culture today get a clear picture of the gospel from wives, husbands, parents, and children whose identity is shaped not by what they see in the media, on television, or through music, or even from the friends and people around them, but may our identity be so immersed in Christ. May we be like a sponge so full of Jesus that when 
things squeeze us, Jesus oozes out in every part of our life.